Season four of Chefs, Deliciousness, and Cocktails starts right now. Woo! And here we are back in another edition of Trey's Chat Out Live. I'm here with John. John Tezor. How are you, buddy? Good. How are you? Good to be back. <laughs> you know, I hear a lot of people pronounce your name, last name, so many different ways. I just gave up and just say T. I, you say Tezar. I said Tezar. I don't know. I, you know, it's it's really Tessar, right? Yeah. But when I was a kid in high school, I just said Tezar. And people mm. used to call me Czar. I moved to Texas and became Tezar. <laughs> so now I just take it anyway. I get it. You know, that's as long right. as you're saying my name, that's all that matters. <laughs> Before I forget about, it, I saw I saw uh, this is off subject. Before I forget about, it, I saw uh, Michael uh, uh, Passmore oh, yeah. posted a thing on story, a video for, at Whataburger. He said he's got to leave Whataburger again, but he'll be back soon. He, he was down here in Texas uh, peddling caviar. But yeah. He's all all over the state. So I yeah. think he was in Austin, San Antonio. So I guess I he likes Michael. Whataburger. Yeah, he, he likes putting caviar on hamburgers. It's kind of strange, but it's <laughs> the pimento cheese. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're going to get down to you. So this weekend, I want to get this out. I'm going to get the big elephant in the room out. We got Chef for Farmers. We got Chef for Farmers in. Yes, sir. We got a lot of stuff going on there. Chef for Farmers is, is the culinary event in in this region, I believe. Um, Agency 21 and Iris McAllister um, have paired together, so it's bigger and better than ever now. Um, you know, Saturday night, I think tonight there's a dinner at Pages right. that's sold out. I saw that. Um, then we have street food on Saturday down at the AT&T Center. Yeah. The craziness down there. So it's going to be beautiful, I guess. Have you been there? I, I have been down there. Yeah, it's a little... It's a little dicey down it's there, but I think is. on Saturday night you can have beautiful weather. Yeah. You have that big, beautiful mural down there, yeah. and it's going to be a really nice night. And then Sunday we have, at Heritage Village, we have the, the grand event, the grand tasting, and I have um, 10 chefs coming from all over. Uh, Billy Terrell's coming from Nashville. Um, I have Bruce Kalman coming from Las Vegas. Lamar Moore is coming from Chicago. Josh Smith coming from Boston. And I'm, Justin I'm, coming back. Justin Brunson. <laughs> How could I forget Justin Brunson? <laughs> yeah. Alex Seidel can't be with us. He's having, he had neck surgery, a back surgery. Oh. Um, so, the, you know, it, but it's that whole group of people. And then a lot of local chefs, Misty Norris, you know, the whole crew, Peja, all the young kids. So it's, it's a great, I think it's just a great event for Dallas because it's, it's, it's about food and wine and, and, and drinking and all of this other stuff and music. But it's really about gathering. You know, and I think right now we really have to be appreciative that we're able to get that back together again. And it's sounding cliche and all this other stuff, but it really means a lot to me because I miss that energy. And I think that's what really makes our business worthwhile is the people that come to see us. I think you're right. And if I was a chef or restaurateur, I'd miss, I mean, uh, hell, I miss it. I'm not, you know, I, I'm in the business, but I don't own the restaurants anymore. Yeah. But yeah, I can understand. I was lucky. I never stopped. You know, yeah. you know I mean, I sold, yeah. I was lucky enough to have all that steak. I sold it out of the, put it in trunks of people's yeah. car with the uh, antiseptic and, you know, it's amazing how far we've come. Like, I, I remember those days where I would be like, sneak out of the house, have a mask on, yeah. I had Lysol spray, and yeah, yeah. hand sanitizer. <laughs> People would pay me in cash, and I'd say, please put the envelope in the trunk of the car. Yeah. And I'd take the cash out, and I'd spray it with Lysol. Did you really? Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> and I'd put it all back together, and it was dry. It was insanity. Was, you know, I, I really think it was something serious and something we need to look for, you yeah. know, look out for in the future. But the way we handled it was insanity. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. I hope we came up with a better plan. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that we learned this time i think you know do, do you to do know, it a little better i do that's what i say i think that we should we learn from everybody learns experience and because something like this happened again only in, in, with a different variable and i think that we've yeah. all learned a little bit about about it. well i think culture has really become very uh precarious in the sense that you can talk about adversity but you can't talk about the solution right because if you talk about coronavirus and how it was handled it's disrespectful to all the people who passed away from it right, right? but they're two different subjects in my mind you know, I have a left and a right side right. of my brain, and they right. kind of function together. But at the same time, I, you know, it's tragic that anybody passed away, but, right. but people do die. And this is not unsympathetic, and please don't cancel me, but people die of cancer, people die in car crashes, people die of gun violence every single day. But we're fixated on this particular, um, I think, tragedy because we've never seen it before, you know, not right. since the Spanish flu. But there's history to it. But we're also seeing human nature in, in this, and I think it's disturbing to see this divide of people where they're, they're just taking sides for the sake of taking sides I and agree. forgetting about culture and yeah. people. And then politicians are using these culture wars as distractions for actually doing stuff for us. 
I agree. You know? I totally agree. And I think you're right. And, and, and the media is still harping on the deaths. Every day, yeah. new death toll, new death toll. And they don't, for some they don't want you to forget about it. And all it does is bring sadness. And, and yeah, they, I, they don't do it with the flu. They don't do it with cancer. Only, no. with, only with this. But see, if you say that, then you're a bad yeah. person. You, know, you could be turned around to a bad person in a second in this, in this society, which is really wrong. I, you know, I love Bill Maher. I don't care if anybody hates me for it. But that show has the most open, honest debate in this country sure. about all different topics. And you can bring... He brings right-wing people or extremist people sure. to, to tell their part of the story. And then this way you could understand that we're all different, but we're all the same in a certain right. way. You know what I mean? And we need to agree to disagree, not be so violent when we disagree with somebody on, on either side because right. everybody's wrong. It's human nature to be wrong. Right. It's human to make, you know, to, to screw up. It's just, it's over the course of time. Right. The, br- the most brilliant people in the world have screwed up, yeah. you know, so... Do you know, I think the reason people blow up now is because when I was a kid, I don't know when you'll remember this, you could sit at a table and talk to people about politics. You could talk to people about yeah. decisions. You could you could actually have a conversation. And now that you can't, people just get mad at each other, and there's no conversation, no debating anymore. You know, I, I had a situation, you know, everybody knows I'm a very mercurial person, and I can get theatrical at times. Um, and that whole Top Chef persona, yeah. I, can, I turn it on sometimes when I use it to my advantage in yeah. real life. Yeah. Where normally you know me, I'm pretty much low-key yeah. kind of yeah. guy. I like to keep to myself yeah. these days. But um, I was Safer. in a situation in business where I was talking to someone I had a relationship in my old uh, building. I had moved recently. And I was talking to them about you know discomfort during the ice storm and stuff like this. And I told her certain things. And they were asking me for these moving out charges. And I was like, I- I'm not paying the moving out charges. And this woman came out from behind the wall, didn't introduce herself to me or anything, just started screaming at me. Right? <laughs> so I stepped back and I said like, Oh, are you one of those woke individuals? Are you trying? Are you going to cancel me now? Because I don't think any human being has the right to judge another one, let alone right. cancel them. And once you start to cancel anybody's opinion, whether you agree with it or not, you're you're playing judge, jury, and God, and I, right. that's a dangerous place to be. And and we have this magic button that anybody can pull, pu- push at any moment, like and just scream like fire in a theater now. Right. And it needs to be dismantled. It yeah. truly does need to be dismantled because it's horrible. Humans are going to make mistakes, and people um, there's 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 societal penalties to be paid for these things. Yeah. Right. If if you make a mistake, or you're that type of person, or you're you know you're doing some unjust thing, th- things could work themselves out. Yeah. It's it's not a place for someone else to say like that person should resign or that person should quit. How about we go to your house and say this, like find something about you yeah. and say, now you have to quit your job. Blow it too. up on social media. Yeah, you can't take care of your family now because you said something stupid one yeah. day. You know? it's just, or 30 years ago. Yeah, that, that's even worse. I know. You know, because God knows if they, someone taped me from 10 years ago, <laughs> I mean, they could turn it into. I, I had it happen to me at the mansion. You know, like if, if, you, if, you, can, if you collect dialogue from people over a long period of time, like an edit, like if you listen to Howard Stern, like when he chops right. up all these yeah, things yeah, yeah, from yeah. people and he can yeah. prank call people, yeah. Yeah. you could do that to anybody yeah. with their own conversation right. and cancel them in 30 seconds. Right. I don't care who they are. You could do that to, to the Pope right. if you had privilege to his private conversations. You know what I mean? This is the insanity of it, that people are using this as a power, as a distraction from actually getting things done. Right. And I, I don't know, I can't tell you why, other than greed and, you know, like, you don't want to get into all these... Maybe yeah, self-satisfaction? The, I get what the planet's burning, like people yeah. are angry with each other. You can't like just no. <laughs> calm down for a minute and like get along with somebody else. I mean, it's like, what do they say? Like Nero, Nero played the fiddle while yeah. Rome burned. Yeah. You know, like, so here yeah, we go. That's... History repeating itself. I, I, just, I just don't think it's, you know, that we're not at the end yet. You know? No, we're not. So how's, how, is, how is the restaurant business going? Is, is everything come back? You know, I, we're very lucky because of my ability to sell those steaks and stay connected with people and, and, and to do a couple of things to keep people employed. Uh, all of our employees came back. And yeah. we actually, it was too long in bringing them back right. because of um, payroll issues and, you know, volume issues, regulations when you can sure. only do 50%. So now that we're back 100%, um, no masks. The employees are still wearing masks. I, I mean, that's a personal thing. Sure. You know, I don't want to get into that conversation. It's like, if you, there's a vaccine out there. I've been triple vaccinated. I had the virus twice. Um, you know, yeah. I'm just going to go on living my life. You, you can, can do whatever you want. I can't believe all the people get vaccinated and then st- and they're still getting the vac- still still getting the, the virus. And you know, I, I had it. I, I had it too. 
And because I was, I didn't quit working either. I was traveling around when this stuff was going visiting with. I had it twice before the the inoculation. <laughs> now it's it's very contagious now in yeah. the Delta in the Delta strain, and it's important that people get vaccinated so we don't have another strain. Yeah. You know, because it it's like even Bill Maher said this the other night. It's a virus. It's always going to be around. Yeah, it's not. It's going always going to yeah. mutate. So you know, like fixating on this one virus rather than the. How about the? Because a large a large part of our lockdown that we all paid for was to keep the, the hospital and the medical system intact sure. from overriding, right? So I don't know about you, but I, I'm an individual payer. I own my own company. I pay a ton of money every month yeah. to get medical, you know, f- to have medical coverage. This was basically being told that we had to all chill out and stay home because the hospitals were, were, were filled. You know, so there's a whole other political side of this that, like with hospitals, like build more hospitals, don't build more hospitals, medical insurance, coding, all of this stuff, and how much it costs the average person to get medical coverage and prescription coverage. It's it's a nightmare. You know, that yep. that's what we learned about this virus. And I think that's harping on the virus and rather than focusing on that is another distraction. And we're all going to pay for it. We're yeah, all we're paying we're, for it now. Yeah, but I mean, we are. It's going to we're going to pay for it. That's what, you know. Yeah. Give it all up money, and we're going to. This pay is for turning it. into a political I discussion know, I today. But, <laughs> but I, we should we should pay our bills, and we should focus on infrastructure, yeah. and give moms and people some leave. You know, it's, yeah. it's that time in the world that you know. If, if Jeff Bezos, I'm sorry, the man looks like a penis. His <laughs> his rocket ship is in the shape of a penis, and the logo of his company is like. It's like that penis, you know, like the, that the erectile dysfunction yeah. thing you see on TV. It's yeah. a curved. Yeah. To me, so I, I'm like, like. Tax that guy. He should pay something. Like I'm, I'm looking at him every day. He delivers something to my house every day, yeah. or my neighbors. Right? Mine he's too. all over the place. Yeah. He's got a spaceship that goes like up to what, like the the tip of the atmosphere, and he's not paying taxes. That's the guy you should go after. Yeah. No, that, not me, not you, not the working class person. You yeah. know, I, I believe that this is something in the next two years. I think they could have handled this a different way. They could have given people in business like no two years without taxes. Right. Right. Would it would have been more uh, like, you know, uh, I think organic because a large part of small businesses, we pay taxes and it takes right. away from our profit. Yeah, it does. If you could give us two years of like not having to pay the government money rather than the government giving us, you know, funny, a whole lot better. funny money. And yeah. then, you know, this PPP scam yeah. where you just like kind of put people back to work at a higher wage. Right. So you can pay it back, which is really what the problem is getting to the, the restaurant people. Because right. if my dishwasher was making five hundred dollars a week. And the government started giving him eight hundred. He's not going to come back to work for five hundred dollars no, a week. He's not. Whether he loves his job or not, he's going to look for eight hundred dollars a week. He's been living on that for the last eighteen months. Right. That that's the next problem to solve. Right. It's not about like oh the unemployment or they gave too much money. They did. They gave too much money. Yeah. Why wouldn't you just give the same amount of money that someone made? Right. It was overcompensation. Like if you would have just paid me to stay home the same wage. We that I was making. That I was making. Yeah. I would be happy, right? Because I'm not working. Right. I'm not, I'm, I have plenty of time on my hands, but I'm, my bills are paid and I'm still living in that lifestyle. We, we gave everybody a bump. And, yeah. you know, that's another question is whether we should give people more money in general. So yeah. that, that's, <laughs> that's where the balance is. And yeah. that's where I'll get blowback from people. Because, yeah. you know, people should be making at least 15 to $20 an sure. hour. I don't know how you live in the society without you it. Can, yeah, just not and, and you can downsize and you can, you can make people more efficient, and, you know, and teach them and train them which I think is a missing art from the restaurant business too. Everyone wants to hire somebody that's been like, you get their resume, oh, they worked at the French Laundry, they worked, there, they went yeah. to Alinea, they went here or there. Oh, let me hire them, you know, and they, they, they peeled onions there. Right. right. But it's yeah. on their resume, so you hire them. But, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm opening all these restaurants in the country. I'm going to people, I want people that are just like coming out of jail. Yeah, yeah. Right? You can't get a job yeah. in college. Yeah, that's great. You didn't go to college. Right. Right. And I'm going to train them. You know why? Them. They work hard. Yeah. And they, they, it's not even a question of stereotyping that they work hard. It's just they, they need an entry point and they're going to be appreciative. And I'm not going to ask them to wash dishes their whole career. I'm going to say, maybe you come in and show me who you are at this level. It doesn't have to be dishes. And if you want to go to that level, here's the place to do it. Right. And I tell all my, guy, my guys every day, this isn't about me anymore. This is about you. I created an opportunity, a stage for you to perform. That's right. You got to have a box. I gave you a box, the John Tezar box, right? We have the dry aged steaks. We have a reputation of seafood. Everybody loves our pastas. We make them from scratch, as a lot of people do. These are basic fundamentals that people sensationalize constantly in our business when they should just be focused on. And every day they need to be at a certain level everywhere.
you know, right. and then you then you get your award or be right. on your list, you know. Not we do it in reverse. We chase, like I was saying earlier before we went on the air. I used to chase this stuff, and now it's yeah. just like I just go to work every day. But I think, John, I think you're right though. I think that if you take somebody like that and they, and and they're appreciative and they work with you, they won't they won't leave you either. That's a problem we have now. These people flopping around restaurant to restaurant to restaurant think they oh, think they deserve or earn or, or earn, should earn more. It's That's a ba- it's here. a balance between opportunity and and income for yeah. sure. You have to give them a stage where they're going to learn. And an opportunity to be seen on top of it. There's these younger chefs need to be seen. They want to break out on their own. And I don't discourage. I, I'm past those years of jealousy or monitoring somebody else's success. That To me, that was the greatest waste of my career. It was like worrying what other people were doing. Other do, you, than do, the knowledge. Do, do you think a lot of chefs coming up do that, though, because they feel like they have to? I think it's a natural progression. Yeah. You're gonna, you have to be competitive as a young chef. You want to be found. And so you're looking at trends. You're reading magazines. And this is where the business has really failed us. And it's really failed us during the pandemic because, because of politics. All of these media companies jumped out the window. Yeah. They wouldn't write about anything. No, I opened I two restaurants during the pandemic. Not a screech about us yeah. anywhere, you know, except locally in Orlando when we opened up Knife and Spoon. Yeah. And I don't care because it's successful. The customers are doing it. Just, it, to me, it just showed me that you don't need all that. You just really need to have a great restaurant or something that people can relate to and then perform every day. And then the word of mouth is much larger. And then I find from the word of mouth and all of those people that wouldn't pay attention to us because of the politics of the pandemic are now going to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah. And I saw an article in a magazine, which shall go unnamed last month, where they just kind of threw four restaurants that opened up during a pandemic. You know, like it was like <laughs> little article blurbs. And they're all, again, you know, like, and, and I have these conversations all the time. All these writers are now under pressure from their editors to go younger, ethnic, more diverse inclusion, which makes everything look like a Benetton ad. Sure. Right? Which is kind of cool that everybody gets included. But are we focusing on quality or are we focusing on imagery? Kind of like participation trophies with kids. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's worse because it's imagery. And we're living in a world where that image, you know, the Instagram, the TikTok, the, the stories, everything else, no one, has a, no one has an attention span for more than 10 seconds. Everybody's putting up their, the, the great moments of their life. You know, and kids are reviewing the, right. the, the great moments of everybody. Even the loser has a great moment, right? right? And right. that's on whatever it is. Right. So er, if you go to that social media every day, think of when you start your morning, you, everyone yeah. grabs that phone. Yeah. And they look like, how many likes did I get? <laughs> what, what am I going to post today that's you know, not going to humiliate me or be interesting? And then you think, because I have these same thoughts now. And I, the other day I was to myself, I said, this has got to stop. It has to but stop. But you should have it, though, for, for your thoughts or for, for, or, or for, for uh, Orlando or for Dallas or for Laguna. Yes. Because it's your business. Yeah. And you po- all, almost everything you post is busy. I don't, you don't post a, you don't want buy in your personal business. I know how you are. But you post a lot of business stuff. Yeah, because I'm two different people. And yeah. people haven't understood that my whole life. Let's say it was either the mansion guy from the cover of D Magazine and the guy on Top Chef. You know, and the second time I did Shop, Top Chef, you saw more of me because yeah. – I just kind of like grown tired of like chasing the bad boy image and having everybody like when you walk in the room, they're like, oh, my God, here it comes. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's he going to say? I'm like, no, I'm not going to do anything. You know, this is, cause I'm having a good time. How are you? Nice to see you. Yeah. Want a hug? Yeah. You know, take a picture. I, and I don't, you know, that whole celebrity chef thing, I don't. Unless your guy Fietti making a hundred million, I don't. I think it's a waste of time, to be honest with you. That was a that was a great that was a great deal he made. Yeah. A, oh no, no doubt. Let's see, there's entertainment. Yeah. And then there's culinary, and then they cross over. It's it's two different fields, you know. Like yeah. if you're if you're a chef in a restaurant every day, you're a chef in a restaurant every day. If you have the ability to step outside of your own kitchen and become a celebrity and be an entertainer. That's your choice. I yeah. don't begrudge anybody their success of that. It's I mean, a lot of work. But it's not, it's not really what we do yeah. for a living. You know, yeah. It's not really what I do for no. a living. So let's talk about that. During the pandemic, I, fl- I did fly down. I flew down to, to, for your, when your restaurant opened up in Orlando, and I loved it. Thank you. But you were right. I mean, it, was, it was like a ghost town down there. I mean, the hotels. Oh, and- with, with Disney World closed oh, and man. all the theme parks closed. And the hotel, this is a test, a testament to like, my happiness. Like People ask, like, what's changed? Like, right? I opened a restaurant in a Ritz-Carlton. In a four, I mean, like, this is a Beautiful billion place. dollar yeah. resort yeah. with a five million dollar renovation. Yeah. It used to be Norman Van Aken's, and they put me in there. Yeah. Okay, so you know, I've <laughs> always had a hard time wrapping my head around, it. you know, from chasing all of this celebrity chefdom and looking up to all these guys. Another thing that happens is you don't realize that you 
you might be there yourself, you yeah. know, in a certain way, in a certain way. And I, I never look at it that way. I just really go to a restaurant. I look at the food and the whole nine yards. So we had that opportunity. We did it, and it was Ghost Town, and the restaurant was packed yeah. every I know, night. Yeah. And it was crazy, and all the local writers got behind it and wrote about it and came. And the hotel was amazing to stand behind us and go forward with this and the ownership. So, you know, it, it's amazing. Th these guys might give us another opportunity in Hawaii. So it's not, it's oh, not certain yet, but I'm working on something with Sheldon Simeon. Um, and it's kind of like Star Noodle, which he did on Maui before he had his own restaurant, um, Lineage and Tin Roof. Right. And, and meets Knife, so to speak. And it's in. I can't tell you the hotel at this moment because yeah. there's somebody else in there. Do you think you think you'll have, you think you're always keep the working, knife theme? Yeah, yeah I mean the, the the key to my long term success is the is the supply chain. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 You know my relationship with Heartbrand and Forty Four Farms yeah. specifically Forty Four Farms. Yeah. We're trying to increase that because I'm trying to get into a host, host, wholesale re, uh, meat business. I'm sure. sure. Um, these guys have asked me to help them dry age meat and try to sell them to H E B and Central Market potentially. They have relationships with them, so we're working on that. But coming out of the pandemic, there's two issues. There's how many cattle there are, and right. there's how much shackle space. This is what people don't understand. <laughs> no, they like don't they, understand. They go to a steakhouse they and they're eating their... steak, yeah. but that, that guy's <laughs> buying steak from X, Y, and yeah. Z, Allen Brothers, all these guys. I'm dealing with the the, the cattle from right. like the, the pasture. Right. Eating the grass, right to the pasture. Eating the grass <laughs> to the slaughterhouse, to yeah. how it gets to me, how it gets to Orlando, how yeah. it gets to Laguna, right. how it's going to possibly get other places. And then how, how do I keep that chain rolling and the consistency going? And then we have Knife Burger now. We're, we're doing Knife Burger in Orlando around the JW. You are doing it. Okay, yeah, awesome. It's like a beach club around the pool, but we're calling it Knife Burger. Oh, it's cool. It's January. This January it starts. Same, same, same burgers? Same burgers with all 44 farms, you know, and I'm doing the CVAP. Uh, okay. So it's the fast food right. version of our Knife Burger. Right. And it's expanded. We're going to have some seafood burgers. So it's kind of like, remember that thing I did at Royale yes. with those guys? Yes. It's kind of, we're going to take some of those successful, like the salmon burger, the shrimp burger, the lobster burger, because they want that there yeah. in Florida. So it's knife and spoon kind yeah. of thing. So we're going to do the 44 farms and the seafood burgers and then some salads. And it's all about getting the food out faster and a higher quality around this pool and making it a beach club that, and that's going to be awesome it's going to be great Jan Janel and i'll have to come back for that and, and my buddy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to come down for that for sure yeah. and, and and now florida's totally open everything's oh, yeah. wide open oh down yeah it's there. been open for a while yeah and um we're also a buddy of mine josh smith has uh all town fresh in boston and it's a gas company that is um doing um healthier food and moving toward the future where they see that more there will be more electrical cars, right. more um, need for healthier food along the highways. Right. So these guys import gas. They own all these gas stations on the Connecticut and the Mass Turnpike. Wow. And we're going to start doing knife burger there. So that's another challenge is like how do I get 2,000, 3,000 pounds of ground beef to Massachusetts. How are you going to? You, would you? Would you? How are you? You're going to have to. Well, have they a, just they have a dispensary because they have all these locations. Right. I will just southwest. I get it right from Forty Four Farms or Cavanis ship down it. in Houston. Ship it direct to uh, by Southwest Freight. They pick it up. Eventually, though, when we get this business going a little further, and I'm not getting into the meat business. I'm just yeah. getting into like this John Tzar branded uh, Forty Four right. Farms dry aged beef and ground beef that you can have at home. And you could see it in other locations because we're spread out around the country. I'm going to be 64 next month. I'm not getting any younger. Yeah, I've moved. you don't act 64. Well, I, I'm not. I don't feel it. I don't <laughs> yeah. look it. But I, I, I am it, and I have children. And you know, I'm not selling out by any means. I, I'm doing all of this with the intent to be a good dad and sure. and take advantage of the success and and get our product to people who really appreciate it. You know, because the demand is there. Speaking of beef. I've got some pictures of I've just got a, a pictures of, of stuff here from Knife and then and then and then Orlando and then a couple from Laguna. Can we play? Can we play those, Ron? I want everybody to see them. That's Knife. Here. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful picture. That's like it? probably a sixty day <laughs> yeah. ribeye. And then this that's is Knife how... Knife and Spoon in Orlando. I love that that play that that, that whole Our logo. Yeah, the logo in the the. That's a dish from Spoon all the way. It's a yeah. it's a, a, a diver scallop that we get live. We shuck it fresh. And then it's just lightly seared and has dashi and truffle and brown butter. And we have an amazing, in Orlando, we have a world-class pastry chef. She's awesome. You know, it's a resort. It's, it's an incredible place, and the desserts are amazing. Yeah. Just look I, at them. They're, they're works of art. They're true. I mean, we have great pastries everywhere, but in Orlando, our pastry chef is, it's, you know, like right out of Paris, these desserts. I love this one, too. That this is dry-aged foie gras. This is a dish that Gerald made with some truffle and uh, I think 100 and 20-day dry-aged foie gras. Yeah, it was so, good. It was very good. Yeah, you've tasted that. You're yeah. with a few people. 
that's a, just a goal. You know, we're down there with the gull shrimp, so all the shrimp is great and fresh. I, and I love that presentation. That's all Gerald. We'll yeah. give you credit for that. And that's a 44 Farms uh, tenderloin. It was delicious. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we have an outer reef. Here it is. This Beautiful, is next. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, three years in the making. People don't believe it's going to open, but it is. If you can, I, I can't, you know, it's, I it's not even in that picture, but it's before the renovation. But yeah. this, these are some classic, that, that's a La Bernadette dish. We can't ever, but that's a picture of my interpretation of Eric Repair's pounded tuna dish. Yeah. And, you know, um, Outer Reef is going to be something special. I don't think people realize, because, you know, my, most of my reputation is here in Dallas and Texas. But we're going out there and I'm doing a seafood restaurant on the West Coast that's going to be all West Coast seafood. Yeah. So at Spoon, we took seafood from all around the world. Uh, mostly East Coast because that was my repertoire right. and that's where I grew up. And now that we're going to be on the Pacific Ocean, I'm not I'm not flying fish from the Atlantic right. Ocean to the right. Pacific. So I've done a lot of research. The, the good thing, and this happened before Knife. This is the one positive thing about having to wait or being comfortable enough to wait. I had Spoon, and it took 18 months for Barringer Harvard to pull the trigger on Knife at the Highland. Right. Now, seven years later, you look at the success. And in that 18 months, I didn't have an income from it. I was frustrated. I wanted to get to it. But I had all this time to develop it. So this restaurant on the West Coast, I've had three years. Right. And every, you know, during the pandemic, <laughs> the website, YouTube, <laughs> fishermen, you know, yeah. famous restaurants, Manresa, like, <laughs> you know, talking to um, any seafood chef on the West Coast and getting the vibe and seeing the, the products that they work with. And so now we're going to be able to just kind of unleash three years of Pent up frustration yeah. and a lot of knowledge into this beautiful restaurant, right? You saw it's yeah. right on the oh, it's Dana Point Marina yeah. and, it, and the sunsets and the patio. We redid the patio. It's a $2 million patio with six fire features. And you're right there. There's right there. Right on Doheny Beach. Yeah. So you can, it's not even there. The, the renovation, that you can't even see where the restaurant is. It's on the other the side, side of the yeah. Yeah. So. I, you know, you know, I, used, I lived there for 10 years. Yeah, I know you did. And when you were talking about, I was so excited when you started talking about this three years ago. No, and, and, and you, and it's like every time I talked to you, every time I, saw, I was following you, it was not, you know, no setback, no setback. But by the same token, what you just said, most people design a restaurant, they slam it together, they build it as fast as they can, they do the build out as fast as they can, yeah. they do many as fast as they can, and they open it up and everything, nothing ever works right. Generally, you have a lot of quirks and things you got to work out. Oh, always. All the, now all the time you've had, that is the positive. I didn't think about that. There's one thing left. We have to wallpaper the hallways in the bathroom, and it all comes down to hiring. You know, and we're in the middle of the hiring process. So if you're in uh, Dana Point, California, or <laughs> Laguna Beach, or even Huntington Beach, and you want a job, come on down <laughs> and see us. It's a Marriott Cliffs Resort and Spa. It's a Marriott Hotel in Dana Point. Great benefits, great wages. Um, there's even a union for some yeah. of you, breakfast um, and lunch. There'll probably be a union in the kitchen. But oh, that's that's, awesome. that was part of the hang-up is that the union came into the hotel during the pandemic. I, don't, I had a contract preceding the union. Then we had the, you know, it was the, that, it was the union after the pandemic okay. and then the pandemic and then seasonality within the hotel. And this is part of like, while well, you can wait when you work in a hotel rather than if you had a real estate spot where you sign a lease, right. that thing can sit there for two years because they didn't have it in the first place. It's not on the, the spreadsheet right. or the P&L. So I'm an addition to it. Right. So they can do without it until they have it. You know, so we get, we got very lucky that way that we survived the whole pandemic because a lot of times people would just cancel those projects or they would have to back out of the lease and it would have never happened. So you said so the union came into the hotel during the pandemic. Yes. So it was it was a union and now, and now the hotel's union. The owners of the hotel own another hotel in New York. OK. And I think that lent, um, you know, you can't have one hotel with a union and one without. And okay. oftentimes in these hotels, the housekeeping is what first turns to the union. And then it spreads throughout the hotel. I learned that in Vegas. That's what happens. Like anytime they open it, like Steve Wynn had Wynn without housekeeping right. for the first three months. And there were all these protests. Right. And, I remember. And then the housekeeping went union. And now everything's yeah. union. So it's like it's part of the politics of a hotel that I don't really have to deal with. Right. And I can negotiate around within my contracts. But that gives me the ability to survive this three years sure. of, of not you know, being open. Every hotel in Vegas is union, right? I believe so. I believe I'm, so. I'm For the most part. Yeah, there are some that have, like, when you're in Mandalay Bay, when we yeah. had RM Seafood and we were uh, in that Mandalay place. Right. The, once you were outside of the hotel, it was non-union. So Rick okay. didn't have to have union people there. But once you crossed that line, everything was union. in the hotels themselves. So, John, let me ask you a question. What is your, what is, what is your, what, what has been your biggest hurdle or your biggest um, feat in opening up restaurants so far apart for you? What, what, what has been, I, 
has, has been the, the biggest thing you've had to overcome or, or issues you've had to solve within yourself as a restaurateur and a chef? It, it's just the motivation to constantly go back and check, right? Because, you, you know, it's going well. And it's a two it's a two pronged uh, kind of situation in the sense that you have to motivate yourself to go back, but you also don't want to offend the people that you've put into positions there, like you're standing on their shoulders all the time. Right. Because Gerald is a very accomplished chef in his own right in Orlando. I let him go, and what we talked about earlier, I create this box. You have the dry aged beef. You have my seafood dishes that we put on the menu. My pasta dishes. Some of the salads. Which we're more, you know. Um, I give Gerald a lot of latitude right. in Orlando because it's a different part of the country. Yeah, so he totally has, different. Yeah, yeah, he has he has uh, different products, different seafood. So I let him incorporate all that into it, and we've you know we've collaborated on these things, and then you kind of let it go. And then also, it is a Ritz Carlton, and a large resort, and they have a you know Ritz Carlton has a big hand. Yeah, they do. On my head. <laughs> yeah, you know, they so do. Just, so, <laughs> yeah. but I I have a restaurant in the Ritz Carlton, yeah. so you know I, right. I do not bite the hand that feeds me. Right. I truly appreciate it, and it's been a very successful partnership and with the owners and with Ritz Carlton. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. You know what you just said? What's funny? You just said I didn't think about this till now. All three of the rest of these restaurants are geographically in way different parts of the country. Yes. The only one thing about those restaurants that will work ever were steak. Everything, yeah. but everything else is totally different. Totally different. Very every 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 restaurant is very different. Yeah. And I don't try to replicate because that's not what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not taking like. John Tezar Steakhouse and putting it in every yeah. city. It's like I'm asked to build a restaurant within a resort or a hotel that's going to keep guests on the property, basically, right. and then also bring locals to that restaurant right. as a destination. So I'm not trying to force feed my concept from Texas down their throat. I'm trying to create a, a restaurant around their environment but the dry aged steak is something that universally people think is yeah. the greatest steak they've steak ever had. Is, yeah. So where it's my kind of calling card. Yeah. And you know, I, I it kind of gets me a little crazy because I'm more of a seafood chef than a yeah. meat guy. But I'm, I guess I'm a meat guy now. Well, you've so. got the meat figured out though. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that was that was luck and a, a lot of study. I don't you know, believe you. Uh, that's I was just fixing. There's not, there's no luck study. involved in that. That was study. And that well, was, finding those cows was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, they are. Finding, yep. finding that 44 fob, Bob McLaren and those people was very, very lucky. You know what? Yes, it is. For both them and me. It's, it is because most cattle ranchers aren't like that. Their no. cows do not, are not, they don't produce like that. No. So they don't look like that. No, I'm partnering with a rancher uh, this weekend at Chefs for Farmers, and he's a grass-fed uh, rancher because we're supporting farmers. So my relationship yeah. is with these other two companies, but, uh, you know, we're doing something with a rancher this week, and I'm curious. It's grass-fed. It's very different, and I've had to approach the beef differently. So it's like it's respect for the animal. It's respect for what we do, and I just happen to taste everybody's steak. And Forty Four Farms just happen to have the the best product that lent itself to the dry aging right. process. So that's right. what. How long did it take you to? How long did it take you in your in your assumption? How long did it take you to figure out the dry age process to where you were happy with it and where it was consistent for you? Oh, at least three or four years. Yeah, where I can c kind of control its outcome and its consistency. And the best lesson I've had has really been Florida because mold mold grows like crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah. yeah I just, you saw the box down Atmosphere, there. Yeah. I mean, I put steak in there and I brought mold from Dallas, and the next three days the mold was everywhere. everywhere. White mold too. Yeah. Like, not black mold. Yeah. So it's like a different. Yeah. People, people have to understand, understand what we do. Yeah, yeah. We have to understand what we do is that we we develop because of the feed in forty four farms specifically. There's no corn. It doesn't ammoniate. Um, it's more vegetal and it's more fermentation driven. So it becomes sweeter as it gets older rather than more acidic and ammoniated and more like blue cheese. Yeah. And what I've learned how to do is control that mold and kind of take the cheesiness out of that process, right. which a lot of people didn't like in dry aged steak. They'd be like, it's too strong. It's too, tastes like blue cheese. Right. You can see if I can get a steak around 60 to 90 days to 120 days, I get it all sweet and nutty, yeah. you know, and it's not so much about uh, the thing I learned is like, you know, the wow factor is like, yeah, I can, I can eat steak 500 days and you're going to eat it and it's delicious. Right. It's not for everybody. Right. 240 is not for everybody. And, and if I can control that mold, I can uh, serve you a 240 day dry aged steak and it'll taste like 120 day dry aged steak because I'm controlling mold because the mold and then there's other factors to it is that you can't dry the steak out initially. So your fan, because I, I, all these companies try to come to me, these new companies where you can dry age steak. Right, right. They go, will you be an ambassador? Will you endorse it? And I look at the product and I can't really get behind it because the way they're doing it is not the way I do it. Are they it. trying to speed the process up? Well, they're doing it in the old fashioned way and in a very new scientific way that it's home safe. 
with black light. They're still using the black light to kill any bad bacteria. Right. And they're using fans to circulate things. I, I do things at a temperature and a humidity, and the rest is really just a technique of watching it, kind of like what a cheesemaker does. Because yeah. that steak has to bleed. And if you put that fan on and you make it so cold, it's gonna harden up, right? And that'll grow black mold on it eventually if you, right. if you just let it, excuse me, if you just let it rot, yeah. right? But that's not what we do. Right. We just lay it down, very cold temperature, I let it bleed, and then I crank the humidity down and, and turn that black mold slowly into white mold. And what helps the 44 farms is that feed. It doesn't turn, it doesn't want to turn to black mold. We sent it out recently. I'd never sent the mold out before, but Justin Brunson wanted to mass produce this in Colorado. So I sent him some meat, I sent him some mold, and he sent it out to a lab because he's really a charcuterie guy. Yeah, he he has an FDA plant, he makes all of these salumi things. So he had to go do that to make it legal for right. himself. Right? What we do is legal because I do it under temperature. It's right there, you see it, everybody loves it after seven years. But he goes through this rigorous process, and we found out it's nothing more than vegetal penicillin. So that goes back to my theory. What, 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 a, what a great thing to find out, though. Uh, organic oh, chemistry by <laughs> duh. You know, like, yeah, that's <laughs> seven awesome. years of duh. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. I got all the answers for yeah. you now, folks. <laughs> That's funny. That's great, though. But that's now I'm the expert on it. Yeah, I tell everybody. I tell everybody. Don't think of it as a mold. Think of it. Think of it as a glove because it's just protecting the meat to yes. make it better. That's why I tell everybody. It's it's doing more than protecting the meat. Yeah. It's it's there are enzymes like you know a lot of meat. They put papaya enzymes on the end of it if you go to processing plants as a natural tenderizer. It's kind of like a natural MSG. The same thing with this mold is it's that eating. You know, first of all, the the let's explain what dry aging beef really does. It removes yeah. all the blood, the water, and the impurities. It shrinks the fat. Um, whatever encases in that, then the fat still has moisture and flavor in it. So it's drawing the flavor from that fat into the meat, right? And then the meat is also shrinking because you're taking all of the moisture out of it. So it's just, it, the only thing you're really doing is intensifying the flavor that's and fair. tightening up the texture. I just fixed it. That's all you're doing. That's, it, it makes the flavor, it makes the flavor very pronounced. Yes. And, and it's it just, it just, to me, it's more delicious, but I guess it's not for everybody. And that's where the mold yeah. and the flavoring and that technique come in because you want to create a sweet, savory flavor balanced by the salt and pepper on the steak rather than something ammoniated and cheesy that really is just overpowering on the first bite, especially when you look at a piece of steak, your mouth starts to water. You're used to right. that steak flavor. The last thing you want is a hard piece of cheese right. in your mouth. And we don't do that. Yeah. You know? I, I like you said, it's just salt and pepper. That's all you need. Salt and pepper. That's, you know, Texas yeah. taught me. I, yeah. I, I think I told you that story a long time ago. I did the Texas. I was in the professional division of the Heiko Texas Cook-Off. <laughs> My first year, I was at the mansion. So a big shot comes to town, you know, from Vegas, out of New York. So what do I do? I buy like a Japanese Wagyu steak and I, I put this balsamic rub on it and cook it perfectly, put it in the box. The guy that wins did a, like a ribeye from Creekstone with salt and pepper on it. You know, so I was like, okay, lesson, lesson one, you're in Texas now, buddy. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Simple but perfect. It, it's so funny. You know, I've, been ju I've been judging a lot of steak contests now yeah. for the last couple of years. And I, I've realized, and, and the ones that taste the best to me, are just a little salt, a little pepper. Yeah. People try to inject and put all this stuff on there, and they come in, they're saturated with salt, and it's just not. That's for barbecue, man. I, I know. Don't turn that steak into barbecue. <laughs> but you know, it's just people think they all have the, all these odd, crazy ideas, Yeah. and it's just simple, good meat and salt and pepper. Well, we're living in a world of crazy ideas. Yeah, we are. And this is what's Social media, that's why. Yeah, that, that, that I think is the, if anybody says what's wrong with social media, is that people just to, they get to make shit up. And pardon yeah. my French, but I had to use that word. Yeah. Because that's what they're doing. They're just going on that thing and making stuff up. Yeah. And then there's no relativity to history. And then we have a generation that doesn't want to study history. And we have a, a portion of the, the country that wants to get rid of history. I don't think we should change anything in this country. Yeah. Right? Because if you want true equality, right? This is where people are going to jump on my case. True equality is you got to forget the past. And you got to move on. Right? right? We've all had adversity, and I'm not going to pick groups, and some groups have had m much adversity, but, you know, the, the group is that we're human nature. We're human right. beings. Forget about race. Forget about where you come from. What language. How about we come together as human beings and just treat each other with respect? And part of that is understanding other people's viewpoints and understanding history and what made us who we are today. You can't just make shit up.
Yeah. You know, and I think that's part of politics, too. They're just making stuff up now or in denial. You know, this you, anyone can go on in, in this echo chamber and say something's not true or these conspiracy theories. It's, it's just shameful. Why it's do really you think, shameful. You, well, you know what the other, another problem is that they make it up, but that the people actually believe it. Can't you just look at something and go, oh, that's just that's shit. Well, I, I, I agree with you, but that's, you know, that's a bigger societal problem about education and, and uh, also where you grew up. Yeah. You know, because I understand there are rural towns in this country where, you know, white people don't know anything else but, like, the, what they're, what they read the 200 with, people yeah. they grew up with. Got you. Right? So you can't expect them to, to all of a sudden become super malleable and, and, and accept everything. Right. It's what they're told. Right. Right? The, I, I believe politicians should get parking tickets just like you and I get, you know, if we park yeah. in the wrong spot. If you lie, you get a parking ticket. Yeah. Right? If a politician's caught in an overt lie, he has to pay a fine. And if he gets, if he lies he over and over, and the fine gets bigger, bigger and bigger. bigger. <laughs> and it doesn't come out of his fundraising; it comes out of his bank account. Yeah. And you'll see the lies will disappear. It's like if you took money out of politics, all the politicians would disappear. <laughs> so you know, I, I, I'm not the one that's going to save the world. You that's know, a pretty good idea. That's like your idea you had last time about gun, about gun, uh, gun and Yelp owners. You said, yeah. "I don't want to take them away. Everybody should just just have a license to do it." Be Same thing. You got a car, get a get a gun license. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then if then there are fines for misusing yeah. your gun. Yeah. Like don't make it. We demonize everything, and then it scares these people that don't know any other way. Right. And you can't take away. Like if I'm out in rural Texas and I have feral pigs and all kinds of freaking varmints, you're not. You know, I'm having a gun. Yeah. And I don't have a gun now. I never believed in guns. <laughs> I had a gun once. I almost shot myself with it by accident. Not not for any other psychological reason. <laughs> I've, I tell people I don't have a motorcycle for the same reason I fell off my bicycle when I was a kid. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm adventurous. I like to yeah. do things. Yeah. You know, like it's a tragedy. You know, like that thing that happened with Alec Baldwin the other day. That, oh man! Like there shouldn't be any. What is a bullet on a it's movie set? It's, it's not his fault. It's not his fault. He was he was doing his job, and he and he relied on somebody else. The, the story shouldn't have been so sensationalized, no. but the media's out to get Alec yeah. Baldwin because he's such a prolific liberal. You know. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Speaking because here again. Yeah. So, but uh, I got I got a video I want to show you that you made. Can we show that? Can we roll that video, please? Um, just a great video you made, John, and I want to show it. Uh, it's about uh, during the pandemic and. Uh, uh My name is John Tizar, chef and owner of Knife in Dallas, Texas, Knife and Plano, Knife and Spoon at the Grand Lakes Resort, Ritz Carlton in Orlando, Florida, and soon to be Outer Reef in Dana Point, California at the Marriott Cliffs Resort and Spa. I'm probably one of the luckiest people in the world because I had restaurants all over the country and they were just about to open when COVID hit America and we shut down not only the country but the entire restaurant business. And luckily I had all of this dry-aged beef or knife, it was a blessing. And I was able to come up with this scheme thanks to 44 Farms and Chris Shepard down in Houston. He said he sold his inventory in 24 hours and I had all of this meat. So I just brought in two of my employees to cut and bag, and we put 32 ounce steaks together. I would sit here every day, Fridays and Mondays. You can place your order on Instagram. And the people of Dallas, the people of the country of America really came and rallied around us. We thank God for the reputation of our steaks and, and the friendships we developed with our customers and, and people all over the country, because I wouldn't be here today. So during the pandemic, you know, we had to do a lot of takeout and delivery. So thanks to Metro, um, I had a hot and cold box, which I was able to roll around not only the restaurant, but to events and to people's places and be COVID safe. And it really helped when I was selling steak, putting it in people's trunks of cars, that I could keep that steak the right temperature at the front door in my Metro cool box. And the Metro, I call it the club car. I can take it anywhere. You can do table side with it. I can take it to demos. It has every insert for Lexans, it has cutting boards, you can slide it. It's extremely versatile. It's way better than a kitchen counter and it's on wheels. If every chef should have it. The important thing to realize is that in March of 2020, COVID decimated the restaurant business, not only from coast to coast, but around the world. And here in America, we lost some of the greatest restaurants that ever existed. People were literally forced to be unemployed overnight. So those of us who are still here now, not only are we are appreciative, it's time for us to give back to our community and really appreciate our guests. And I can't tell you that this pandemic was something that really transformed my life as far as gratitude and appreciation. And the fact that I do have these restaurants all over the country and I do have all of these wonderful teams of people who have now come back to work and help us survive this. 
I just want you all to be thankful and grateful when they wait on you and serve you because they went through a lot to be here today to help you. That was a great video, John. Oh, thanks. Did you have fun making it? I did. It was Chef's Roll, and uh, you know, you saw the sponsors on yeah. there. They're just great guys to be able to do that and get the message out. Really, the about you know surviving the pandemic. Really, what it was all about. So, and those those companies really have, you know, Metro shelving. I mean, we're in every rest, in yeah. every restaurant in the country. So they're just great people. And Chef's Roll is, a, is an awesome organization too. They make, know, that's where that chef coat came from. I, I know. I know. I don't wish this on anybody, but we all learned so much in the, about this about this pandemic with the restaurant business. You know, survival techniques and, and new operational things you can actually keep, and some you can't. But uh, it's just uh, you know, I told everybody when this thing was going to be over, if it, it was going to be it was going to be hell to pay if your restaurant was still trying to do all the takeouts you were doing and the d- dining seating if you have not if you had not prepared yourself to figure out ways to do that and some of these restaurants I've, I've seen have, have actually closed their takeout down because they couldn't do both and then some have mastered it where they've got two 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 different uh, outlets one for drive one for a takeout or to go and one for you know sit in dine in I mean our, our to go definitely has increased and we've always done it because of the we didn't have room service for the longest time so if you stayed in a hotel you could call down and place a to-go order and we did it that way so people will occasionally call to have food taken at home we, we don't use any of those services because we don't you know, we really mm-hmm. don't need to and they, i think they take too much yeah. sometimes but um we're not that type of food that's to go right but i do have a good announcement now that you brought it up i wasn't going to promote okay. this but we're going to start lunch at the hotel but it's going to be knife burger oh at the hotel so, at the hotel so like seven seven days a week we're going to have lunch, but it's Knife Burger. Okay. So we'll have five or six, maybe seven burgers a day. There'll be a little card. You can get That's steak. That's awesome. So it's burgers, steak, salad, and maybe one pasta. That's it. And we're going to call it Knife Burger at lunchtime. So you can come and do takeout. Um, you can come and sit down and eat or you know, sit at the bar and have a burger and go back to work. So we're going to be announcing that very soon. So you've got you've got Knife Burger in Plano, which is about to open back up. Yes. Uh, y'all it's open for lunch. In the Willow Bend Mall. Right. Willow yep. Bend is good. You also have the butcher shop there. We, um, we've closed the butcher okay. shop to make the transition to this kind of wholesale retail meat okay. business. Okay. And George is going to use that space as another private dining room out there. Okay. Because the mall didn't have enough foot traffic yeah. to justify it. That. And we sold enough steak during the pandemic via FedEx and delivery and mail and stuff like that, that we do, we do mail order now rather than have a, a walk-up butcher shop. How does that, how does that work? Is it, I guess, is, how, does, how does mail order work for Eventually, steak? we're going to have a website where you can do all of that. We're going to okay. sell uh, dry aged steak, ground beef packages already in pre-made patties. We're going to have beef jerky. And then I'm going to use uh, Justin Brunson's bacon. And Michael okay. Passmore's caviar, <laughs> and it's all you can see. We're using the Passmore caviar right. at Knife and Spoon. We're yeah. branding Passmore caviar under my restaurant's names, okay? So people can get that caviar. It's my blend, my salt. You know, my sure. working with Michael or after all these years with the restaurant's label on it. So you can either buy it from Michael or buy it from the restaurant or on the website, and that'll be up after New Year's. We're just, you awesome. know, I wanted the pandemic to totally be over. I wanted the restaurants to sell. Yeah. I want to get Dana Point open. And then we're going to do this. It's, we're not into biting off more than we can chew, but we want to make these things available. And as Knife Burger is growing, I want to be able to offer pre-made five and six ounce patties to anybody that wants to buy them. Awesome. Yeah. So I want to ask three. I want to ask you three quick questions. What is your? But, but for you, what is your favorite thing about Orlando and your favorite thing about about Laguna or about Dana Point? Oh, it's the location. Orlando is the people there. Right. The resort. Everyone that works for us there is just like amazing that ritz carlton hospitality the training from the time you park your car yeah. to everything we have a beautiful pool an amazing spa yeah, it's gorgeous the adjoining jw marriott <laughs> yeah. 18 hole the greg yeah. norman golf course yeah. uh canoeing paddling kayaking mountain biking it's an actual resort yeah and if you're mm-hmm. higher than the seventh floor you can see the fireworks from disney yeah. every night you don't have to go to the four seasons by the way <laughs> <laughs> So I love that. It's you know, and it's going to be great for the kids. I, I, all my friends, all my friends have come down to Orlando already. Awesome. Like whether they come to eat at the restaurant or to play or cook with us. Yeah. So and and Laguna is just you know like I'm a surfer from yeah. way sure. back. Yeah, when. you are. So I have Doheny Beach over there. So you have Ohana Fest with Eddie Vedder and yeah. all these rock and roll stars every year. You got the beach right there, the marina right there. That view is killer. An hour to Los Angeles, ninety minute plane ride to yeah. Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Two hours to Mexico. Yeah. It's what's not to yeah, like. Yeah, that's right. I love Laguna. I, you know, I, it's beautiful. I, I, it is. 
it, it's it's so beautiful. It's it's almost fake. Does that make sense? It if, is. If, if it you, does. It does appear to be fake at times, yeah. or just storybook yeah. like. Yeah. And the thing I like Dana Point. Because Dana Point to me is more of a working class community. It is. You're exactly right. And it's right. a beach town and there's exactly surfing right. and music. Yep. Yep. And people aren't as like crazy as Newport. Right. You know, Newport's a little yeah. uptight. Oh, yeah. You know, a little uh, very. You got to dress up to go to 7-Eleven yeah, in Newport. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That whole quarter there from 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 Newport all the way to, to, to down Dana Point to uh, past that San Marcos is absolutely beautiful. Gorgeous. And surfing paradise. We have Salt oh, Creek, man. all, you know, like it's the beaches are not really beach beaches, but they're great surfing beaches. So, you know, you put on a wetsuit and jump out there. I saw they, they had they have whale watching or close to the, the hotel. I saw, I saw we big... have the most amount of whales like right at Doheny Beach there and, and Dana Point Harbor. We attract a lot of ocean life there. There's a lot of spotting. There's whale watching. And, That's and cool. the seafood is amazing. I mean, how, amazing. How can you how could you how could you not love <laughs> delicious award-winning seafood maybe some steak great views whale watching i mean what why would you ever want to leave i i have to i have to come <laughs> I home i have to come home and take care of the kids <laughs> single dad life you know so now that you've got knife figured out and you're back up with the knife but what, what is your favorite thing about about the knife concepts for you is I, I i really think it's the people that come and support us for the last seven years i mean i can't imagine anything else working without them you know and and i can't I can't even come to words to express the gratitude going back to the opportunity and to where we are right now and how it's changed my life. You know, because as, as a lifelong restaurateur, right. a chef working the line, critical success has a tangible value to it. Right. Monetary success will change your life. Right. And, and as someone who struggled as much as I have my whole career monetarily in the restaurant business. As an indi- you know, I owned my first restaurant when I was 24. Right. I didn't go the corporate route. I've 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 flip flopped. Yeah, now, now I've now I've gone the corporate. Well, route, you know right? what though? I think I th- I don't think it would have. I think you've learned, and I think you've you've all you, with all your knowledge, you flip the corporate route because you understand you understand the business better. Yeah, Las that, Vegas taught me a lot about yeah. how hotels work, and how restaurants work within hotels, yeah. and what you need to do. And a lot of it was the those celebrity chefs were asking for way too much money and not delivering. Right. So once my reputation became large enough, and this is what Knife afforded me, is that. If Knife's reputation is not so much about John Teaser as it is about the steak, right. you know, certain people may think it's about me or like my personality or all the things that I've done. But it re- that restaurant really has been there for seven years and is so busy every night because people come for that steak. They do. And that's been giving me the opportunity to show people that I can not only open other types of restaurants, but I bring that steak along with it and it's kind of the foundation of what we do. And let's face it, Americans love steak, and they love seafood, too. They, a lot of people here don't understand seafood because we're not on an ocean. It's getting bigger. Yeah. It's getting bigger. Yeah. All because we can get fresh seafood here now. Before, it was like, I got fresh. No, you don't. It's frozen. You, you don't have fresh And food. I'm still poo-pooing what they call fresh seafood, so I'm not <laughs> being a snob. But yeah, yeah, I bet you are, yeah. At, at, at Outer Reef <laughs> and, and in Orlando, yeah. those fish are in the water yeah. yesterday. I know, yeah. Or hours. In, in the case of Orlando only hours ago right and then it goes right onto the menu and right. we serve it that night so that's i wish i could do that in dallas but you know you can't because you have to put it on an airplane yeah. or a truck to get it here yeah. so it's, it's not it's not anything about dallas it's about seafood is that perishable yeah. all right so this weekend we got uh, before we get out here you got chef farmers again yes. chef farmers and uh you're gonna be main there. event on sunday i'm in the vip with all my buddies I'll i be have there. <laughs> uh, I, i'm doing steak and hamburgers um i let me go. I, I want to give this guy a plug out because ex Dallas Cowboy. Okay. Ex Dallas Cowboy. <laughs> and he's been, plug been absolutely fantastic to me. Well, it's going to be fun. It's at Dallas, it's at the old Dallas Heritage Village. Yes. And uh, I think it's Happy Hollow Meats. Happy Hollow Meats. It's grass fed steak. We're going to be serving primarily that. And I have backed up with a little 44 Farms ground beef. Awesome. And, um, you know, in the VIP, we have Katsuji's going to be there. You know, my oh, arch yeah. nemesis from uh, yeah. Top Chef. Yeah. Casey Thompson from Top, for all you Top Chef fans. Oh, will be yeah. There. Gerald's coming into town. Lamar Moore is on all kinds of television. He's That's out of Chicago, awesome. a barbecue guy. Bruce coleman has been on Top Chef. He's really good friends with Dave Grohl. He's the guy that introduced me to Dave. So yeah. he's got the barbecue place uh, in Las Vegas, Soul Belly. I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm getting old. I'm trying to remed, plug yeah. everybody's restaurant. <laughs> But the, the, I'm, come and see us, and you'll you'll yeah. get to see them there. I'm excited about I'm excited this year. And there's still tickets available for the yeah. main event um, and yeah. and for Saturday street food at the uh, awesome. AT and T Center. AT and T. Yeah, I, I'm excited. I'm excited about seeing it. And your social media, John. Uh, yes, I am Chef John Teaser yeah. on Instagram. Uh, my Twitter account was taken away from me temporarily. 
That's why I couldn't find you. I was I, like, what I, the hell? Twitter took I my like, account away. I knew. I was like, what the hell? What'd you do, John? You make it look, oh, we're, we're, Sean Hannity and I just don't see eye to eye. And I guess I said something that was inappropriate. To but it's very unfair. It's very unfair. Yeah, it's I'm, very I'm fighting unfair. to get it back. Yeah. If Sean Hannity and Fox News have their Twitter accounts, I should, John Tizo should have my Twitter That's account. That's right. Back. So if you care about this, please tweet, give John Tizo his Twitter account back. So thank you. John, John I know, thank you so much for being here. I, I was, I'm glad I got down the route and proved what happened. <laughs> Uh, this weekend, I guess, we got Sheffield Farmers. We also have World Food Championships. Um, we are judging uh, Monday and Tuesday the finals. And uh, so we got that going on. If you're a chef, I'm sure there's 1,500 different chefs over there from all around the country. Uh, but other than that, the retail business and the culinary experience is going to be at Sheffield Farmers, which I'm super excited about. And you can find everything for it for, from us at www.tracechowdown.com. We have a restaurant guide. Of course, we have all our blogs. Our new blog came out yesterday, our new uh, article Best fried chicken in North Texas. Uh, I spent two years eating fried chicken, all these joints. And it's it's not just a trendy chicken. It's bone-in fried chicken. And it's old restaurants. It's new restaurants. Um, and you'll really like it. So if you like fried chicken, go to check it out. Uh, I've, I've got I've got Mexican fried chicken in there. I've got Nathan's fried chicken there with 25 spices. Nathan, Nathan Tate from uh, Rapscallion. You'll really like it. So check it out. We'll see y'all this weekend at Shepherd Farmers and World Food Championships, and I'm sure you'll see John and all his buddies over there. Thank y'all. Next week, same time, same channel.